Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquest podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today I have as my guest Angelique Ruiz. She's the CEO of Bold House. Angelique, welcome. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So could you give 60 seconds on your background so people know where you've come from and where you've got to? Absolutely. So I spent 10 years in corporate in America working for some of the largest uh, brands. And after 10 years of working directly for leaders in the C-suite, I left to start my own consulting company, helping those leaders or those types of leaders. And about two years into that, I was inundated with small business owners and self-employed experts who wanted to know how was I winning all of those corporate clients. And so my second act for the last 12 plus years has been leading Bold House. We recently rebranded, but that company, uh, which just made the Inc. 5000. And we teach and mentor self-employed experts, small business owners, and diverse business owners on how to win B2B clients. So that's me in a nutshell, but it's all based on that decade working inside of corporate, hiring hundreds and hundreds of outside experts, consultants, and vendors, and not hiring thousands more right okay so tell me this then as a buyer of those services on the corporate side what frustrated you that happened repeatedly when people were selling to you well on a personal note one thing that frustrated me is they assumed I wasn't the decision maker so there was a lot of bias in the process because of age and gender. So that was that was on a personal level. But on a very strategic level, Marcus, what drove me crazy was that the sales team would come in with an agenda and that agenda had no appreciation for or empathy for the reality that me as a decision maker was up against inside the organization, the inertia that I was up against, the interdependencies that I was up against, the lack of time and bandwidth and resources that I was up against. So when a salesperson comes in to have a meeting and they want to ask certain qualifying questions, they want to ask things like, well, what is your timing for making this decision? Well, who the hell knows? I don't freaking know. The CEO doesn't know. I mean, when I was in the energy industry, if a hurricane like the one that's just hit here in the US came in, all bets were off. I mean, who the hell knows when you're going to make a decision? So just the complete lack of reality and damn it if they just didn't want to stick to their process and their stupid questions. So that's what drove me crazy. Excellent. I'm I'm definitely going to be whipping that clip out I think because that was pure gold and god knows being on the receiving end where someone's trying to get you to meet them where they want you rather than where you are in reality what do the best of the best do differently can you think of the best buying experience The best buying experience was when a company would come in and say to us, look, at some point in the future, you guys will have to deal with this issue. What we would like to do right now is share with you a little bit about what some of your competitors are doing and what we're doing as part of that process. And we want to give you certain red flags to look for and also give you a reverse timeline so that if you are going to address this issue, you start noticing the the warning signs on the dashboard and then you have a realistic timeline of the conversations you're going to need to have internally and the true arc of what this is gonna have to look like. And we wanna give it to you before you have four flat tires on the vehicle. So let us just share it with you. And because you're going to need to have internal conversations about this. And we recognize you already have 17 other number one priorities. So 
let us share this with you before you've got those flat tires. Those companies always really won our business. And if they didn't win our business, they were at least one of the top two finalists of winning our business. And it was because they educated us. It wasn't solution selling because we kind of already knew generally what the solution was. If you have a flat tire, you need a new tire, you know, it's, but it's, what do you need to be planning on? What else will be impacted in your organization when you step into this? And really doing that degree of relationship building, that's a much more genuine come from than some of the nonsense around solution selling and some of this other bullshit that's out there. So this therefore confirms my suspicion. And I'm a bit slow, uh, so it's taken me a while to get to this. But the the most obvious realization is the best kind of opening position is to have someone who is deeply trusted hand deliver you to somebody who has precisely the problems that you're expert in addressing versus the referral Mm. or the future pipeline, which is I was like, you should definitely speak to Jim. Jim, let me tell you why you should speak to Angelique. And, you know, this is my experience of working with her directly. To, hi, tell me, what budget have you got? Now, if we look at the probability of conversion, even to a first conversation, where does your greatest opportunity lie? Yeah, I mean, for starters, no one has a budget. No one knows what their budget is is, I mean, that's a decision that happens, frankly, so far down the sales process that if they can tell you what their budget is, you probably missed the opportunity to work with them anyway. So I I, I don't know any decision maker who's ever gotten that question, Marcus, who felt, first of all, that you have any right to ask me that question. Like if you have to ask the question, what's your budget, you actually don't have the right to ask. If they felt comfortable sharing that number with you, you're already in conversation with them and they're going to start offering it to you because they want to make sure that they're not wasting their time with you. So that question should just be burned. I mean, like, let's just get rid of that question forever. I think in terms of handing off, I agree with you. The only thing is the one thing about referrals or, you know, to me, it's more of a strategic introduction than it is, you know, sort of a passive referral. When when we do strategic introductions, I think one thing we have to remember is if the decision maker who is, is on the receiving end of that introduction isn't in a sort of ready now place or ready soon place to have that conversation. We have to make sure that there's a reason that they want to have that conversation right now. So my company has a conference coming up in about four or five weeks. And if someone made an introduction to me right now on any of the business challenges that I want to solve in 2022, I really don't want to talk to them right now. It's not, it doesn't even register. But if they said to me, Angelique, we know that sometime in 2022, you're going to probably need to address this issue. And we also know that you have a conference coming up in four weeks. There's actually something that you could do at your conference in four weeks that would help us get get you, help you gather some information that when we would have a conversation in 2022, it would actually be a much more fruitful conversation. So we wanna share some things with you. That starts to make it, and, and that's obviously a microcosm example here. That's like on a micro level, but we start finding relevance to their life now. And I think that salespeople are historically uh, just awful, just gener- awful at trying to understand making something relevant to a decision maker now, even if that decision maker isn't in a ready now buying place. And that just, I don't understand it because it's such an obvious human 
instinct to want to talk about what you care about right now. So I just don't know why salespeople are so thick about understanding that, why business owners who are trying to sell are so thick about understanding that. But I mean, I've been doing this now, Marcus, for 12 years, and it's a conversation that we have day in and day out. And it's like, why does that decision maker give a shit about that right now? And so that to me, just, um, I don't understand what, why people get stuck on that. Years of observation of the same lunacy. Um, yeah, lunacy, led, lunacy. Led me, to, <laughs> led me to the conclusion that people revert back to what they learned first without reinforcement and under pressure. So there's that deep-rooted conditioning. And this is why I have a real issue with most training, particularly the stuff that's like a sheep dip. You know, they fly in, uh, enter train, and then bugger off. And, yes. you know, there's no reinforcement. In the field, the recipient of the training should be practicing because the majority, about 70 plus percent of the learning, is that's where it happens. It doesn't happen in the classroom. Managers need to be part and parcel of this whole process in order to reinforce, not using different systems entirely, or else all of your training dollars are wasted. Mm. The, you know, the emphasis on retention, I don't care how much you remember, how much do you apply and how, you know, how often do you end up going to the bank because you sold us just another perfect customer? You know, it's interesting. There's some science around, I love what you just said. There's some science around uh, the way that people draw. And I actually use this technique if I ever teach a, a writing a writing workshop. And I learned it way back in you know, uh, high school, you know, secondary school, however someone draws. So, and I might actually have my audience do this at our upcoming event. If you ask everyone to draw something, Marcus, yeah, they will actually draw the last way that they were actually taught how to draw. So what's really interesting is if you have a group of people draw a house on a blank sheet of paper, and, and, and we've done this in workshops before, ask everyone to draw a home. And most people will actually draw a house the way that they were taught to draw, draw a house when they were about five or six years old. And mom or dad or a teacher sat down and showed them to draw a square and a triangle and a little chimney and a door and two little cute round windows. And that's how they will draw. And the thing is, no one has actually taught them how to actually draw between then and now. We don't actually teach it. And one of the things that goes into art, one of the things that goes into being able, I was a terrible artist when I, when I stepped into this class and I ended up having a painting in a museum, in a museum uh, for, for, uh, for an exhibition was because we don't see what we're actually doing. Our mind overrides what we're doing. So we think we're saying something or we, we think we're conveying something. Thing. But we don't actually see what we're saying. We don't actually see what we're conveying. Our mind fills it in to the intention that we have. And so you actually end up with this very strange gap between what your brain thinks that you're doing and thinks that you're accomplishing and what actually comes out on the paper. So we see this in art, we see this in copywriting, and most importantly, we see it in conversations. So you end up with, with a mind that's sort of overriding what you're actually doing. And because you know you have this intention, or you heard Marcus, or you heard Angelique say, hey, you know, make sure you're making it relevant. Your brain's like, oh, okay, we're making sure it's relevant. And yet nothing that's actually coming through in our emails, our proposals, our capabilities briefings, our, you know, sales conversations is actually doing that. And we see this gap happen in the human brain over and over and over again. And I think, I think that's partly what you're getting to, but there's a real science behind it. This then raises some really fundamental questions about the environment that we're, we're creating and the people that we're attracting into the sales profession. I rant about this all the time. 
But I look at the waste, the drudge, the human suffering that goes into the typical SDR's life. It genuinely cannot be a pleasant experience by and No, no, um, definitely not. And for such scant return and you know, a, a constant stream of rejection and uh, irrelevance and just interruption, you've got to wonder, how much longer can it even go on for? I, you know, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, actually our favorite people to do sales training with are actually the people who aren't in sales. So a lot of companies, you think about consulting firms where the senior managers and the managing directors or the managing partners and the senior managers are responsible for revenue generation. You look at PR firms, public relations, digital marketing agencies, uh, ad agencies. You look at some IT companies, depending on what they do. There are a lot of even law partners, you know, in law firms, attorneys. There are a lot of folks out there who actually are not, they didn't go into a profession of sales, not not even, not recognizing it, right? They don't. Salespeople. They're accidental salespeople. But then part of the cultivation of client accounts becomes part of their, their job. And, and really you can't make partner or what have you unless you're you're able to generate revenue. That's our favorite group of people to do sales training with. And part of the reason is because we see the greatest absorption, the greatest behavior change, because they truly get what it's like to work with those clients. They truly understand their challenges because they're in there. You know, the salespeople who come in and they promise the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then at that point, they hand off the new customer, the new client over to the operations team. Those people are really the ones who are most stuck in their their ways. And part of that, Marcus, is because who we recruit into those roles, who how we reward those individuals, because those individuals get to move on to the next sale. They're not the ones dealing with the client or the customer account team that now has to correct misinformation and false promises that were given during the sales. They got their commission and now they're rewarded to run off and go make the next sale. Meanwhile, you've got now this client account team that's delivering on on that promise and there becomes a complete disconnect. So we've got a recruiting issue. We have a rewards issue. And it's why we like to, when we do sales training, we say that it's for the non-sales, like our favorite training to do is for the non-sales people because they have greater empathy for, and they have to live with the customer for a long time. So if they don't handle the sales process right, and they, you know, do all of these bad habits that our salespeople are known for, they're going to destroy the relationship that they now need in order to get to a a successful result with that customer. So one thing that I've been advocating for for a long time is that I think that the salespeople need to be part of the customer team. I don't think that there should be this separation of church and state. And in organizations that you see that, particularly things like PR firms and consulting firms, where the managing director and the senior manager who makes the sale is also going to deliver on that vision and promise to the end of the result, there's a very different approach that's typically taken in those organizations. Not always, but if we take a solution-focused approach to this and we look at where are things working well already that we could build upon, that's one of the places that we should be looking at. Now, I'm in the minority, I think, thinking that, but um, but it's I grew up in the consulting industry, if you will. I worked for an offshoot of KPMG that most people well, no, it ended up becoming part of Deloitte Consulting. And we I saw firsthand how it worked in that space. And there are some really good lessons to be learned. I think the mistake many people make is this fixation with having specific sectoral experience or uh, experience of selling a particular product. And what you touched on really is that what you described uh, in our preamble which is the, uh, the a gap between person and pain. And if 
as a seller, you don't really understand the domino effect of someone making a decision in one part of a very complex system of symptoms. And symptoms don't make a cause. They're indicators, but then then nothing more than a clue as to what might be the underlying cause of your problem. Now, because businesses are very complex, even with three or four departments, there's a huge layer of complexity. If there isn't clarity in terms of what the organization is intended to exist, to deliver its reason for being, then lots of people will probably think that KPIs actually matter. And what we're looking for is certainty in an environment that if you play the long game, there's a lot of uncertainty. But if you don't play the long game, then you're in a super competitive where situation where about 2.6% of the time you'll win. Well, I mean, look, there, there, there's never been certainty. I think the pandemic at least helped people to get there, although it drives me crazy when people say that we're that there's all this uncertainty now as though there wasn't always all of this uncertainty. I, I don't think the level of uncertainty has changed um, over and you know, it's just it's completely uncertain. Everything is uncertain. And you know, we look at this idea. So, so I said to you also about the idea that we have to question everything, right? Yeah. This idea that you can even really help organizations get clarity, I think, is somewhat silly. I think, I think leaders today are trying to lead their business wearing roller skates while skating on an ice rink in the middle of a cyclone. I mean, like that's kind of what we're doing, right? We're all kind of just fumbling through. So when we're selling today, it's really about making the best possible decision with the variables uncertain, but using the best bit of judgment that you can and mostly pointing in the right direction. And I think that that's a big mistake that salespeople are almost trying to be too certain, Marcus. And I think that that idea of like that confidence and proving that this is exactly where you need to go is somewhat out of touch from an emotional intelligence perspective with leaders today, right? So you go into a meeting and you want to try to tell me with certainty that, you know, this is happening and this is happening and this is where we need to be. You don't fucking know that. Oh, sorry. You don't know that. No, 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 that's fine. And, you know, so if you come in and you say, look, given what we know now, you at least, you need to be moving in this direction. If this is a two-year or a three-year, a multi-year engagement, a multi-year thing, we might very well have to make changes along the way. But if you have to make changes to this, we're the company you want to work with. We're the company you want to work with because we actually are fantastic and we're going to show you how we can actually roll with it if we need to make changes. If you decide to do an acquisition, if you decide to do a divestiture, if you try to do an expansion, if your supply chain gets shut down, if this happens, if that happens, we're actually going to bake that into the process. You know, that's the kind of thing that just surprises me that people lean, they're trying to lean more into a pushy certain vibe versus actually being honest and saying, no, 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 this is the direction you need to go. There's no question this is the trend. There's no question this is the trend. This is where we see it going. You have to start on this now, but we're going to build this out in let's say a three-year plan. We're going to get in place the things we know. Then we're going to, this is what we think we're going to do, but we're going to reevaluate with you every step of the process. And so people are wanting to kind of gloss over that. We still see it today in large consulting companies that they don't want to just talk about the truth of the world that we're in. I don't understand that because when we are making a buying decision, we are driven by all 23 of our cognitive biases. 
And so we, our brains are constantly scanning for threats. Our brain is constantly scanning for what doesn't feel right about this. And if you're trying to sell someone a bill of goods and their brain is going nuts, of uh, this doesn't feel right, they're going to go into a place of, they're going to go into a freeze place, right? They're going to stop moving forward. And they might not even know why they're not moving forward. Salespeople are constantly wanting to know, well, what are your concerns? What objections might you have about this? It's very difficult for a lot of decision makers to articulate the level of analysis that their brain is doing on it. It can be very hard to pinpoint it, but yet you know that something feels off. And I can't tell you how many times I sat in a boardroom with senior executives and what their comment would come down to, Marcus, the real thing that they would say in the boardroom is, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. As a salesperson, you're never trained on how to deal with this doesn't feel right. And you've got 10, 12 executives, all C-level and EVP sitting around going, yeah, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. Well, where is that training? Where, you know, you, that's not in your slides anywhere. That's not in a case study anywhere. But I can't tell you how many times the decision comes down to a nebulous, this doesn't feel right. Well, it's interesting in Bob Mester's work, he makes the point that what happens is you go through a process of comparative elimination. And what you're typically left with is the best compromise solution. Mm -hmm. True. And it really speaks to something that's very important, which is that most sales organizations are fixated on cold new logo business. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, this is an act of craziness. Your best prospects are your existing customers. So Always. is there no way that you can find the time, the effort, the resource, the marketing dollars, and the resources to focus on increasing your wallet share within their entire ecosystem? Suppliers, partners, family tree, alumni, customers, customer, and organic. And then look at nurturing future pipeline. So like you were describing, make sure that you prime the pump with the red flag indicators that they should be aware of. Because almost every single sales organization you come across is pillaging from next quarter's pipeline to make this quarter's quota. And if they have to take out 36 deals to make up the 200 grand shortfall, but then they give a 30% discount. Now they've taken 48 deals out of the next quarter's pipeline. So what strikes me is that we spend so much of our time making it harder to extend the length of the sales cycle, reduce the probability of closing, and piss a lot of people off. Baffling. It's I, really when you look at almost the entire sort of customer journey that sales goes through from prospecting all the way till the end. For the most part, most of it is, is baffling. I mean, I think when you realize that you do all of this work, as you said, very inefficient work to get the prospects, and then you go through the sales meetings or what have you, and then to end up in a board meeting or a, or a senior leader meeting where it comes down to this doesn't feel right. So let's make this compromise solution, right? And you get all the way there. If we started reverse engineering from that place backward and then combined that to the elements that have to be true about the relationship and the rapport and the trust, I think sales organizations, it's why we, and we were talking about in the preamble when you and I were in the green room about, you know, the idea, something we've been talking about for over a decade is this separation of purse and pain. You know, when you're talking to the people who tend to control the decision and the coin purse of paying for things, there's a huge gap between them and whoever is experiencing the pain that's going to be hopefully 
lessened by this solution, whether that's employees inside the organization, whether that's the end customer, the end user, whether it's vendors, whether it's the community that an organization operates within who, or the shareholders, whoever it is, right? But there's there tends to be this huge gap between, between the coin purse and who's experiencing the pain. And that's that's yet another baffling piece to the sales process because so much of the sales pitches, so much of the case studies, so much of the data points and the so-called KPIs that uh, are really there because everyone thinks they should have them, but nobody's actually really driven by <laughs> those KPIs. You know, when you look at all of it, you have to ask yourself, what are we really, what are we really doing here? And I think the entire process of sales really needs to be re-examined inside of organizations. And it starts with really what is the goal of say what is the goal of your sales organization? Is the goal of your sales organization really to be the chief conduit between customers and everyone else in your organization? I think that's where sales is going to have to move. You know, sales really, their role, especially as we get into more AI and, and some of the, the elements that I think will become irrelevant in sales positions, the greatest thing for salespeople to do is to learn to become master communicators, um, not just with the customers, but communicators between the departments and the factions inside of companies, because that's where a lot of this all falls apart. Is, no, you're right. Right. So that's kind of I think we're in. A, I think sales is going to look very different 10 years from now than it does today. I, I do, too. I, I'd be very curious on your take on that. Just to build on what you're saying, though, it's really important that as sellers, we think beyond the people who are either paying us or commissioning us. The people who are going to have to live with the solution that you sold them. Mm -hmm. Do you really understand what it is that they're trying to achieve? What their preferred ideal outcome looks like? Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a, a, a churned customer and your internal resources get tied up. So long as your comp plan drives you to new logos, new revenue and pipeline, it's not going to make the blindest bit of difference to your life. But it does make a difference to everyone else in the organization. And it also means that every year there's more and more pressure on the new business team because they have to make up all the stuff that they pillaged from future quarters and all the discounts they gave away that meant the ARR forever is always going to be lower. So pay heed to the unintended negative consequences of short-term reactive decisions. Well, it's why I think some of the best salespeople are the ones who come out of the client service or customer, you know, product delivery side of things. When you look at some industries and, and you know, some people take, take exception to that, but really understanding what it's like, you know, to serve in the military for 20 years or 10 years or what have you, and then understand how the technology, how the equipment is actually going to be used out in the, out in the field. Um, there's a great expression too. It, one of my favorite expressions, our, our, our executive vice president uh, went to West Point and he was a captain in the army. And so we have a lot of military expressions we use around here at Bold House. And one of them is, is reminding folks that just like the military is always planning to fight the last war, sales teams are always strategizing to course correct for the last sale that they lost. There's a lot of time spent, Marcus, looking in the rearview mirror. And I think that right now, no one can afford to do that because we have to really look forward of how the whole sales process is changing from the buyer's side in light of everything that has happened. Uh, you know, shorter timelines, more pivots within the implementation sequence, the ability to not get too locked in 
to any one thing and making sure you're making decisions that can constantly evolve. I think one of the biggest fears, if, I, if I'm if i the decision maker inside of a mid-size or large organization right now, it would be to make a decision that locks me into a certain direction or a certain technology that you know, 12 months from now, 18 months for now, from now starts to show that it's, it's irrelevant. So you need agility in the solutions that you're selling and you need to start communicating to your decision makers, how you're going to pivot with them as things in the market change. Most companies haven't done that. They have not tried to adjust their approach to the speed that the market is moving. So with that thought in mind, then, your take on the future of sales? I think my first thought is is to the point I made before. I think salespeople will really become conduits. Sort of, what's a good, what would be a good term to use for these folks? To me, they almost need to be ambassadors that are, that and diplomats that are really working across to close communication gaps to create collaboration. You know, one of the roles I could see for sales markets going forward is not just getting that initial logo and dollars, as you said, but actually continuing to be an advocate for that customer or that client within the organization that the salespeople are comped by. Because if someone was advocating for that customer or that client, and actually was more positioned kind of as the um, the ambassador on their side of the table to help move things and, and be the person running to ground the shit that comes up, that customer or client would keep buying from the brand, from, you know, yes. so let's say you're Accenture, right? If you have your salesperson kind of being... Acme Corporation's ambassador and all the problems that come up, you have an advocate and that advocate is also spotting the other things that they need to buy. That customer lifetime value would go through the roof, but we never look at those ideas. Like, you know, most people would think that I'm a heretic for even suggesting such a thing. I wouldn't for the simple reason that that's exactly what I advocate and what you've just described is a good, effective channel manager. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what they do. They grease the wheels yes. on both sides and they play nicely with others. They manage to get stuff done with no power, only influence and trust. They build intimacy with both sides because they put their outcomes before their own. And the emphasis is on ensuring that the partner keeps that customer for life. For life. Yep. And right now that really honestly is a responsibility that is so disjointed between different roles of doing that. And one of the things that happens inside a lot of companies is because of people's need to be right and need to protect their authority over their, you know, their plate, whatever that is, you know, whatever's on their plate, they want to kind of put their elbows out and they want to protect that space. They are so much more concerned about being right. And this is how we do it in accounting, or this is how we do it in procurement, or this is how we do it in engineering, or this is how we do it in quality control. Everyone is so worried about putting, you know, their stamp on it and, and having control over it. The hell with the customer. The hell with the lifetime value, uh, you know, of a customer. The hell with any of that. I just want to fight my internal turf wars. And, you know, the salespeople are just as guilty of this, though, Marcus. I mean, honestly, some of the most difficult people I had to work with in corporate were the sales teams. You know, they just didn't give a crap about anybody else. They wanted their commission. <laughs> And, you know, they wanted to make the sale and God help you if you got in their way of making a sale. And so there's a real adversarial relationship inside of most organizations between operations, sales, procurement, finance, legal, risk management, IT. You've got all of these adversarial relationships, all these turf wars going on 
Um, and so honestly, some of the best sales training, sales training that you could do in an organization would actually be focused on eliminating turf wars as opposed to how do you do cold prospecting? Silent agreement on this front. The stuff that isn't taught on a regular basis and in favor of technique and tactics is just the, the moving parts behind a business. If I sell to operations, who's affected directly and indirectly? What's the ripple effect? If they get this right, they get this wrong. What other parts of the business are going to be affected? How? What does that mean for them? How can you help them build their case internally? And none of that stuff is taught. Listening is this thing that you can make. If you're lucky, you'll get an hour on what the difference is between active and passive listening. And questioning is normally just this list, shopping list of intellectual questions that never really get to the nub of it. I interviewed a phenomenally interesting chap called Alexander Knapp, and he is currently trying to help sort out the debacle from the Afghan withdrawal. Mm. Um, but he's been in every war zone since the 1990s, the Balkans, Darfur, Somalia, Afghanistan. And he's normally first feet on the ground when peace breaks out, trying to coordinate all of that. And he describes these things as wicked problems. And what we're describing here is a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. It's got multiple layers. If you don't look at it from a, a lens that allows you to see the whole thing, then chances are you'll end up messing things up badly because you'll overreact in the short term and you'll try and put a linear solution to a complex three-dimensional problem. So the lesson that I'm drawing from this is that if you can identify where things go wrong and how to correct them early enough, then with very little force, you end up with a multiplier effect. So by the time you have salespeople speaking to customers, it's natural for them to put the customer's outcome before their own commission. And you don't have to do heavy remedial work. But the, the challenge is to try and find those gentle catalysts and build that into your process whilst you're weaning yourself off your old bad habits. But that takes real courage. I love that you said multiplier effect. Um, you know, something that you, that you just uh, reminded me of, one of the things that's often done in the consulting industry, when I say consulting industry, I don't just mean, you know, we work with a lot of solo consultants, but I'm talking about the glue. I'm talking about the McKenzie's, the Bain's, the yeah. Deloitte's, the Accenture's of the world. One of the things that's often done in those organizations is the way that they, not always, I mean, I want to be clear, there's a lot of times they don't do this, but something that that is done in that space sometimes is that when they win a new customer and they're getting started with an implementation uh, or an engagement, they bring a lot of the various factions of an organization together to provide the vision for, for what's happening. And in part, they, they have to, right? Like they're in, a, they're in a role in a lot of these organizations, Marcus, that the tentacles of what they're doing reaches, it, um, it impacts almost every yeah. facet of the company, right? So, but what's really interesting is that most salespeople outside of that space never really think about sort of, it's not just the complex solution that, or, or the, you know, bringing a linear solution to a complex problem. They take a linear approach to a complex sort of delivery, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, a, yeah. Yeah. So you, we have to look as salespeople at how are we actually bridging between the sale and the end result and what are we doing to, as you said, be sort of, you know, those that are greasing the wheels that, you know, responsible for that, that whole channel. And I think that if salespeople took a more active role in that, they would better understand the next customer. They would better understand the next decision maker and, and why we get to a decision that just doesn't feel right as the ultimate objection. And so I think all of this is to say that we have to be more strategic and less tactical. 
We have to be better communicators uh, than we are, better collaborators. And we also have to be more honest. I mean, you have to, you have to, I think, be a bit more authentic these days than, you know, trying to have everything buttoned up and delivered on a silver platter. If we started recruiting different people into sales and we started compensating them differently, if more compensation was tied to lifetime value, uh, to also delivery and that going well, I think we could start to change the dynamics inside of sales. That's a much deeper conversation we have time for. Indeed. Uh, I interviewed Alfie Cohen who wrote a fabulous book called Punished by Rewards. And yes. the academic research on this is quite clear that creating extrinsic motivation lessens people's commitment to do great work. But that's a whole another discussion. What I'm really curious about as we start uh, coming to the final furlough sure. is the whole concept of question everything. If you don't start asking better questions, and you keep approaching the same problem from the position that created those conditions, you're never going to find a solution. So you've got to stop looking at the symptoms and you've got to get to the cause. So what advice would you give to CEOs, founders, in order to get to a much more intelligent place where they're tackling issues like their skill shortage, not by trying to recruit from an ever-shrinking pool, but they're thinking, how can we get more from the people that we do have? And who do we have who has the ability to grow into the roles that we're going to need them for in a year, three years, five years' time? But management is spending so much of its time on remedial, supervisory, punitive activity that they're not really doing anywhere close to their job in sales. So what are the questions that leaders and founders should be asking themselves? so that they find out why they're caught in this trap? Well, I, it's a great question. And I think we, we, have to, we do have to question everything. Humans are absolutely terrible at making predictions about anything. You know, we think about when the telephone was first introduced, all sorts of so-called thought leaders at the time thought that the telephone was going to completely revolutionize the way that we educate the masses. There were people at IBM who didn't believe that people would ever have a need for a computer in their home. And I was sharing with you in the green room that in the 1996 book, uh, Silicon Snake Oil, the author, I think his name's Clifford Stoll, made a prediction on like chapter one that the internet would never replace magazines, newspapers, books, or, you know, newspaper delivery or the, or the corner newsstand. And of course, all of these predictions have been radically wrong. So I think the best question that, that leaders can make well, first is that they have to take time at, at least twice a year to step away from the business and literally get out of their environment uh, and just create a blue sky meeting multiple times. And you know, years ago, you probably could do this every two to three years. Now you need to be doing it every six months, given how quickly technology is evolving, given how quickly supply chain routes are evolving and, and world dynamics. And then you have to start asking, what if? You need to make a list of everything that you take for granted in the organization, which but alone, it's just that exercise of, well, what do we take for granted? What are the things that we're just assuming are true? What if we didn't actually have full-time employees? Like, just ask that question. What if we actually didn't have full-time employees? There was a great article that was written about two weeks ago talking about the death of the job. Um, you know, what if we didn't have any office space? That wasn't a question that large companies were thinking of asking in, in 2019. And yet in 2020, people started asking, what if we don't have office space? So, or, or what if we had 80% less office space? What if we don't have employees? What if we didn't have a sales team? What if we didn't divide our company into departments the way that we do? What if instead of dividing companies into departments, what if our entire organizational structure of silos that we've been operating in for a hundred years 
actually got completely blown up and we had completely different organizational structures. What if, what if, what if, what if? It's in those what if conversations, Marcus, that breakthrough thinking happens. And I think the other side of it is going out and listening to what your employees are saying and what customers are saying, not in focus groups, not in questionnaires, because buyers are liars, employees are liars. There's, you know, those colloquialisms are, are out there because what people say when they're asked is different than what they do. So you need to go into these chat forums. You know, I tell my clients, Marcus, who are, most of them are consultants and coaches and service providers. I'm like, go into Reddit, go into Reddit and read what people are bitching and griping about. Read when people are saying, I just walked into my, you know, boss today and I get, you know, I basically rage quitting and I gave them an F you and I walked out the door and here's why I did that. You know, customer, people are, people are talking. You have to go listen when they don't think that you're listening. And then you need to put those issues up on the board and you need to say, what if we never did that again? What if we never got ourselves in a situation where a customer or an employee said that because we completely eliminated that as a possibility? So I think the question is, what if? But I think what you put on the table for what if are the things that maybe two, three years ago, you wouldn't even have considered spending an ounce of time asking a what if question about it. I think every single facet of business as we know it belongs on the table and deserves a what if conversation. Couldn't agree more. On that happy note, um, let's start wrapping up because that was a brilliant way to conclude. In terms of your own blind spots, where do you find yourself not noticing? I think for me, I have a blind spot around, how would I say this? I have a blind spot sometimes, Marcus, around myself not questioning as much as I should. And also, I think giving leaders more credit than I should. I think absurdity knows no bounds. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You know, decisions that fly in the face of all reason and logic knows no bounds. I am an eternal optimist, but my optimism often causes, I'm a realist, but still my optimism creates a blind spot for me. And I think that we have really reached the height of absurdity, certainly here in the United States where decisions and behaviors fly in the face of logic and the desired outcome. And so unfortunately, the last two years for me has been a reminder that humans tend to constantly take action and make decisions that are self-defeating. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Okay, so you've got a golden ticket. You can whiz back in time and whisper in the era of the idiot Angelique age 23, when you were invincible, immortal, and you knew everything. Uh, one bit of <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, if I could go back, if I had that golden ticket to go back, I would have said, start my business sooner than I did. I started when I was 20, about 27, 28. I wish I would have started right then at 23. Number two, I wish from the get-go that I would have thought like a CEO and a business owner, not as a self-employed person. And number three, I would have spent more time immediately mastering sales because we're all in sales. There's no role out there that doesn't involve sales, whether you're an employee or not, you're in sales. And I would have leaned fully into understanding the psychology of sales at that age. So I would have started my business faster uh, and I would have focused on building the business instead of being in the business. And I would have focused on mastering sales. Excellent. Okay. And if you were to recommend one or two books or podcasts or videos that you'd recommend people pay attention to? I read 50 to 100 news articles a day. I think books are great, but by the time they make it to the shelf, Typically, that's a six to 12 month process. Book publishers are going to have to figure out how to condense that because we need information more quickly. So I spend my time reading 50 to 100 news articles a day. 
I read financial news. I read trade news. I read international news. I read consumer news. I don't think that you can afford today to have your nose too close to the bark. I, you can't be working in the weeds. You need to take time every single day to understand what's happening in the world. You need to understand what's happening in manufacturing, technology, uh, on the in the financial markets, and for the average human being. And so for me, Marcus, I read about 50 to 100 articles a day. I am a very fast reader, but I retain all that information. I retain a ton and to me, that's where you need to spend your time today. You need to understand the world around you and you need to understand not just what people are saying, but more importantly, what people are doing. Excellent. And how can people get hold of you? The two best places to go, the first is our website, which is Bold House, which is spelled B-O-L-D-H-A-U-S. So a bit of the German spelling there, boldhouse.com. And you can also check us out at realdealevent.com, which is our annual conference. So you can check us out there. And of course, last but not least, I'm the only Angelique Brewers on LinkedIn. So please feel free to connect with me there. Angelique Brewers, thank you. Thank you. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful and insightful, please like, comment, share, tag someone who could benefit from it. And feel free to give an honest review on your favorite podcast platform. In the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. Stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.